Josiah was king at eight, and the closest to him was Joas, who became king when he was seven years old. Both were God-fearing, and both repaired the temple at Jerusalem. Good kings are rare, even in Judah, and Josiah is the last of them, and we shall follow his life today. A warm welcome to you again, brothers and sisters. God's Word is rich, resourceful, and bears words to eternal life. And we are glad to have you again. In our last discussion, we were looking at King Hezekiah's folly in displaying all his treasuries, silver, gold, spices, and armory to the emissaries of the Babylonian king who sent greetings and gifts for speedy recovery. His reply to prophet Isaiah, who rebuked him with God's warning of an imminent attack by Babylon, was one of immaturity and selfishness. Hezekiah thought it was okay for any disaster to befall Jerusalem and Judah if it was not in his lifetime. Hezekiah soon died and was succeeded by his son, King Manasseh. He was evil in the Lord's sight. He built altars to the whole heavenly host in both courtyards of the Lord's temple, offered his son in fire, practiced witchcraft and divination, consulted mediums and spiritists, carved images of Asherah poles, and led Israel astray to commit more greater evil than the nations the Lord destroyed before the Israelites. He was succeeded by his son Ammon who too was evil. Join me again for another session of the Word of God. Our study for today is based on 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedida, the daughter of Adiah. She was from Bosketh. Notice how young these kings were when they began to reign. Why were they so young? Because they lived at a time when there was a lot of warfare. Their fathers died most often in the battlefield when the children were very, very young. And therefore, when they took to the throne, they were young because their fathers died suddenly. He did, verse 2, what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. You notice, friends, the sun has come up again. The light is shining once more in the land. Josiah has come to the throne. He led a movement that resulted in the greatest revival these people ever had after David and Solomon. In the eighteenth year of his reign, King Josiah sent the secretary, Shaphan, son of Azaliah, the son of Mishulam, to the temple of the Lord. He said, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, and have him get ready the money that has been brought into the temple of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have collected from the people. The second thing, that Josiah did was to repair God's holy temple, friends. Apparently, the temple was not in use when Josiah came to the throne. It had become sort of a warehouse, the temple of God, a storage area for odds and ends. Verse 5, Have them entrusted to the men appointed to supervise the work on the temple, and have these men pay the workers who repair the temple of the Lord the carpenters, the builders, the masons. Also have them purchase timber and dressed stone to repair the temple. Have them entrusted to men appointed to supervise the work of the temple. Notice Josiah, friends, very, very particular about details. He tells the people to get busy, to work hard, to 
do God's work to repair the temple. Verse 8, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. He gave it to Shaphan, who read it. The third thing that brought revival to the nation was a return to the word of God. They had lost the word of God. They had lost it in some place, but they found it and they put it back where it belonged. They put it back in their lives. The word of God, my friend, is the only thing we have as a weapon. It's God's word that is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4.12. There is no shortcut. There is no easy route for the method of revival. We have a flood of books and knowledge, but friends, in the ultimate analysis, it comes to the word of God. Let's get back to the word of God. Then Shaphan, the secretary, went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers, the supervisors of the temple. Verse 10, then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. Imagine this. Now Josiah is hearing the word of God for the very first time. Notice his response. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. The fourth step toward revival is repentance. The reading of the word of God brought repentance. When the king heard the word of God, he tore his clothes as an expression of deep emotion. Why? Because the word of God revealed sin. Without the word of God, they did not realize how far they had strayed from God's law. A return to the word in repentance brings revival. Verse 13, Go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book that has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written there concerning us. Josiah is frightened because he knows that the nation and he himself deserves God's judgment. The message God returns to Josiah through Hulda, the prophetess who reveals both God's justice and God's grace. Verse 16 now, listeners. This is what the Lord says. I am going to bring disaster on this place and on its people. According to everything written in the book, the king of Judah has read, Because they have forsaken me, they have burned incense to other gods, they have provoked me to anger with false worship. Their hands have made my anger will burn against this place, and it will not be quenched. Now notice God's grace to Josiah, but because your heart was responsive, you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against this place and against his people, that they would become accursed and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I am going to bring to this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Now Josiah begins his reforms, further reforms of King Josiah. Verse 1 of chapter 23. Then the king called together all the elders, all the elders. Interesting, friends. He calls every elder of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, all the people 
from the least to the greatest total representation. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. To follow the Lord, to keep his commands, regulations and decrees with all his heart, with all his soul, confirming the words of the covenant written in the book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. Amazing, friends, these words. The king gathers all the people not to hear his words, but to hear the words of the God who called him to be king. The people said that not only would they read the word of God, but that they would also walk according to the word of God. They would live in a manner it prescribed. We could have revival even today if we walk in the ways of the word of God. Verse 4. The king ordered Hilkiah the high priest, the priest next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the starry hosts. Remove immediately. Once revival comes, removal starts. Remove everything unclean. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. All the things that pertain to the worship which was false and pseudo, he burned in the fields of the Kidron Valley. Can you imagine, friends? This king stood out. This king, like the turtle, wanted to make progress and therefore he stuck his neck out. He took huge risks. And even as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you must learn, I must learn to carry my cross and walk. Take risks, friends. Take challenges. That's what Christian life is all about. Not to hide behind the Lord Jesus Christ and say, He has done everything for us. He has won the victory. But we must live in that victory. Not defeatist lives, but victorious lives for the glory of God. Notice he takes everything that is pseudo to the fields of the Kidron Valley and he burns them outside the city of Jerusalem. Very symbolic. Fields of the Kidron Valley deep down outside the city of Jerusalem. They are not worthy to be burned even inside Jerusalem. The ashes were taken out of the town so that the people could not even see the ashes thereafter. Josiah puts away all kinds of immorality. Verse 7, he also tore down the quarters of the male immoral people, which were in the temple of the Lord, and where women did weaving for a shira. Josiah had courage. He condemned not only their actions, but he put them out of the kingdom. Friends, if you're a leader, you need courage and only God can give it to you. You need to stand up for what is right. Josiah took great risks and God blessed him. Verse 10, he desecrated Topheth, which was in the valley of Ben, Hinnom, so no one could use it to sacrifice his son or daughter in the fire of Molech, the Babylonian god. Josiah broke down everything that was false, friends, even the groves, everything in the land. And he went beyond the borders of his own kingdom, Judah, as far north as Bethel, can you imagine, going into another nation to clear even that nation of pseudo-worship. And Josiah took everything from the nation he burnt them and dumped them at Bethel. It is interesting, friends, that at Bethel, he came upon the grave of the prophet who had predicted that he would do these things. 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 2. The king asked, What is that tombstone I see? The men of the city said, It marks the tomb of the man of God 
who came from Judah and pronounced against the altar of Bethel the very things you have done. Leave it alone, he said. Don't let anyone disturb his bones. And those of the prophet who had come from Samaria. This we read in 2 Kings 23, verses 17 to 18, the fulfillment of 1 Kings 13, 2, the prophecy is fulfilled here. Now Josiah makes a tremendous positive move. He reinstitutes the Passover. Amazing king. Verse 21, the king gave this order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of the covenant, not since the days of the judges who led Israel, nor throughout the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the eighteenth year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Friends, the holding of the Passover is a wonderful thing. Apparently, it had not been kept for a long, long, long time. They had passed it by. What does it mean? The Passover, friends, even if it surprises you now, it speaks of Christ. You know when the Passover happened in the Exodus period? Just before when the angel of death passed over the houses that had blood on their doorposts. That blood, the blood of the lamb, was a typology of the blood that was shed on the cross. The Passover speaks of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The people had forgotten all about him. Paul says, For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Today, we are trying to have everything without Christ. It was God's effort to reach us, friends. Remember, not man's effort. Now, friends, we come to the heartbreak of the story of this great king, Josiah. Great revival had come, but soon his people will go into captivity God moved in a mighty way to reveal the fact that He can send revival in the most difficult and the most darkest days of life. Now what ended the revival? Notice verse 29. While Josiah was king, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, went up to the Euphrates River to help the king of Assyria. So now, the Pharaoh of Egypt helps the king of Assyria. King Josiah marched out to meet him in battle. But Nico faced him and killed him at Megiddo. He dies. Josiah dies in warfare. He was slain at a place called Megiddo. This is the place where the war of the Armageddon is to be fought in the last days, my friend. The same place where Josiah died. Josiah was a great man of God, but he was also foolish. He entered a battle that was actually not his own. Verse 30. Josiah's servants brought his body in a chariot from Megiddo to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, son of Josiah, and anointed him and made him king in place of his father. We have studied through this book of Kings thus far how God made available every provision for every king. But they chose to do it their way, not God's way. Are you like those kings? Are you straining, my friend? When Jesus himself said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Remember, he who abandons himself on God 
will never be abandoned by God. What a joy it is to study about another righteous and God-fearing king, brothers and sisters. Indeed, such life is hard to find even in our days. As we look forward to wrapping up our study for today, I would like to place before you three areas to ponder upon. First, are we involved in any repair that the physical church or the body of Christ need today? In other words, are we involved in meeting needs materially, emotionally, and spiritually? Second, what relevance is the Bible to us? For Josiah, his heart be quickened and his curiosity ran wild as he was desperate to know what was written within the Word. Finally, reforms, revival, and the jail for the Lord swept over the nation. Dear friend, if you are a vivid reader of God's word, do implementing God's revelations burnt in your heart too? Faith without work is useless, writes James. And it can even be deceptive in making you think that you are good with God. May God bless us and continue to enlighten us. Music